Now recording. Welcome to those watching the recording. Glenn, could I sort of interrupt your eating, please, and invite you to open open and pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings to us, and especially the blessing of your word, the Bible. Help us to learn from it what we need to serve you better and know you better. Be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now we did have a request last week, uh, an urgent request. Please, could we have these handouts at the beginning? and not at the end. So is that a help or is that? Yes, well, it is. Well, okay. Come on. Can we pass them again? Oh, look at that. Um, I, I wanted to start by really getting me to, to say, you know, how would you explain the Trinity? That's oh, that's kind of sense. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is you might not. I mean, you, what? what what do you think? Um, I, I mean, the Trinity, this, this is an essential, I mean, isn't it? This is an essential foundation of the Christian faith, is it not? So what, what do you have to say about the Trinity? Now, could you please bear in mind also that while this is a doctrinal and a, and a theological question that I'm asking, the course is church history, and I've got to be mindful of that. Uh, that in fact the Trinity comes up doctrinal in doctrine one from memory, and so you might have done it to death then as well. But what about the Trinity? What what have you got to say about? It? Well, the simplest one I have here, I wrote it down. There's one God. God is three distinct persons, and each person is fully and equally God. Okay, okay. one God, three persons, each one God. distinctly yeah. and fully Three. God. I think. Oh, I'll second that. Third, so for us. Say the nice and crazy. Done. Nice and great. Mm. I put these together before this meeting because of the no you, Yeah, you came, you came knowing that I was like to ask a question like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Anybody else like to say anything about that? How do, would you explain that to someone who has no church background? Mm. Well, in, in a sense, that's my question. Too. And how do you explain that to a Muslim student, the yourself, who says Christian Christians have three gods? Indeed. Mm. Yeah, that and I think you'll find that uh, a, a Hindu might tell me the same thing. Mm. I think the only thing I would add is that God's three different um, parts, but each part has a distinct mission. <laughs> and I also agree with definitions yeah, yeah. of final I'm not from the definition, but I think that. I think uh, I don't think they're necessarily treated equally in the church. Sometimes we actually yeah. come to that because that's yeah, that, that's part of the um, <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely part of the history. Other than other than thinking, why on earth am I possibly reading this stuff? Right, I'm trying to remember who's who in the zoo. Mm. The, that was the predominant question I got about, mm. about this chapter. This chapter is. Some parts of the Godhead are treated differently to others, and it depends where you go. Mm. And that perplexes me. And even if you, you might even say that even if the claim is these are three equal mm. persons in the Godhead, yet the practice does not necessarily seem to be. No, so. that, well, that was that's that mm. was exactly what prompted me to. Mm. come up with that question and and that's uh, and you'll see that comes up in the history mm -hmm. i think that um it's actually a church school of ministry book on its own mm -hmm. i don't think we traverse the it, we we break it down to one sentence which to me is uh, that's almost infathomable to try and put it in one sentence. Would you say, would you still use the word almost? Would, would you Would you prefer to use that statement without the word almost? Is that possible? In, so the statement would be, 
It is infallible. Um, to define the um, <coughs> there, is, there will always, well. It's a certainty for me, but there are other people that might have better word and skills than I do. You, but you're certain, you're certain in the Trinity. Does that, does that enable you to explain it in a way that can be understood? I mean, when we talk about unfathomable, infathomable, should probably should we? When we use that word, what are we saying? Well, we lack. It is so deep that we lack the understanding to understand it yes. fully. Fully. Mm. Yeah. You know, we, we can go a long way to, as I said, as a separate book, going to the you know, complete theology of the Trinity, um, and we would still not probably scratch the surface. We, we don't know. What was it? Uh, look, Augustine doesn't come up till next week, but what was it Augustine said? Something like trying to empty the ocean with a spoon or so? I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure I've quite got that right, actually. Yeah, that, that concept. Yeah. Mm. If I could just give a little plug here, there is mm. a member of our church, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Service, who's um, haven't seen much of that because she's so busy, because she's finishing a book on the Trinity. Oh, wow. Um, However, I did manage to grab her when we were doing preaching through the Apostles' Creed. Um, and there is a podcast for those who know how to access such things mm -hmm. called the LMAP Leaders Podcast, 93. And the second one was with Dr. Jackie Service, and she talks about the Trinity. So you say in our church, when you say our church, what church? Glenbrook. Glenbrook Church. She goes, well, her kids come to Glenbrook at six, okay. and she has been known to come at six, but I haven't seen much of her lately. So she's a doctor of what? Theology. Okay. She teaches at St. Mark's in Canberra. Okay. Does she indeed? So she why doesn't she get to preach in church? <laughs> she's got that clear. If she's uh, capable. It's very really yeah. powerful. Oh, sorry, did I say something I shouldn't? She's, uh, I'm just pointing you towards a podcast that I did with her. That's very uh, thankful and Gary. I see what she sounds like. She's really quite a really clever lady. She's a very clever lady. What's so, the last name again? Service. So where is this podcast? On LMAP Leaders Podcast. Okay. I don't think she should run a seminar on it. It's not just I, I, I have asked, but she's too busy at the yeah. moment yeah, because she's finishing a book on it. <laughs> I've got to show it. And and she's yeah, she has a family, she's busier than I am. At the moment, she must be busy. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. To you today, yeah. I know how busy she is. That's what I'm um, saying. I would add somebody that I greatly respect in his work on the Trinity, and that's a guy called Kevin Giles. Oh, um, no. He's a Melbourne guy. Yeah. He's in Melbourne. Sorry, he was in Melbourne. He was. I, um, wish, and in Adelaide wish, for a while, more college train. And I was at uni. Yeah. Probably a bit of a renegade from Sydney. Very good. Okay. What? It's not just it's not just the Trinity that we can't explain. It seems like time in creation. Exactly. And there's there's so many there things things. about God sure. that we just don't have the sure. ability to understand. Well, what I'm going to start us off by doing then is is reading from a, you know, we've got God as the Creator. <clears throat> Reading from John 1 and reading those <clears throat> just those first 14 verses, if somebody would want to do that for us. John, John 1, 1 to 14. Sorry, John 1. One to fourteen. Are yep. you there, Jackie? I've got it. Okay. Do you want me to do it? Yep, you go. Right. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, 
He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. Although the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, that's that's one thing that we have to deal with. Um, you know, we talk about the word becoming flesh. We talk about, uh, well, Jesus uh, coming into the world. And, and uh, how do we do that? How, how is he God? Um, and yet he comes from the Father, you know, how does, how does all that work? And you would be well aware that uh, the people who are Unitarian words have to alter some of the wording of those early verses to make it make sense to them uh, and use the word God in a different sense from what we would. And that's, that's how we have to do it. Okay, Jesus, flesh and blood. Can we look at the first letter of John and chapter four, only verse two. Just one verse. You got it? Chapter four, verse two. Chapter four, verse two. Oh, I'm reading it then. Oh, okay, you do. Don't I'm not reading it. Chapter of You've been given permission. Yeah, it <laughs> This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledged that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, that's that seems to be a real test, you see. If you're speaking by the spirit, and there's another one, then, then you're going to acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh so we've we've got that as well and over in uh, second john we don't very often read this in letter of john but verse seven if you do the same or maybe glenn this time i can do it thank yeah. you yeah. Go for it, Tony. i say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge this is coming in the flesh have gone out into the world any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist yeah so deny that jesus came in a in a real body so this is an issue even before uh, even in the first century as, as to who jesus is so my next thing is was the son generated by the father we talk about the son of god son of the father was the son generated by the father i mean that's that's a question that the early church was dealing with you've probably got an answer to that well no it just seems like a natural supposition is Indeed. something people would naturally uh, not even assume if you're the father, god's the father then he had a son well yeah obviously he must have been generated by the, the father that's yeah. what you would assume I would, I, I you, I but yeah yeah I, I do understand that you're yeah. saying your answer to that question is no but yet it's it, it just it's seems how you would naturally assume that mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah okay can we say the lord our god is one as well as Jesus is Lord. What, what? Look, an example might be some. We do. Well, we do. <laughs> some ninety, um, and you know, might be might be quoted. Um, wait a bit, Lord. Through all generations, you have been out before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. Before you gave, so that that's one God. Yeah, and that's, we understand that. But then we're also saying that Jesus is Lord, and we're actually saying Jesus is God as well, mm. as, as what we've said there. So mm. we're saying God, God is one, Jesus is Lord, Creator is Lord. Does God exist in different modes? Now we're coming to the 
we're coming to a heresy now. <laughs> Wash your mouth out. <laughs> well, I can see how they would have thought that. Yeah. And the other thing I find interesting is like the disciples and the, the apostles, they didn't articulate this. Like it was just, yes. it's sort of obvious, but it wasn't until I was looking at it, I thought, oh, yeah, of course they didn't. But John in particular had an incredible understanding. Yeah. And so maybe if he was asked, John, what do you think if you, you know, like you wonder what he would have been able to articulate if he was given that word and said, what do you think? You know, it's just interesting because he had an incredible gift mm -hmm. and others did too at top. But I just think him, especially when you think how he talks about the word. But without articulating a thing that you identify as Trinity, yet clearly that's you you would say that's the understanding mm. I, I in a way I, it's against my dad a story he, he was my dad was deacon in a pentecostal church and i was probably about 15 or 16 and so they they got the deacons of the church to do a brains trust for the youth group you know the sort of thing oh yeah yeah can you explain the trinity and it, it, they were all having difficulty and my dad said well it's like this. I'm father to my sons. I'm a husband to my wife. And I'm a son to my mother. So it does make sense. Now, of course, as a 15 year old, I couldn't possibly identify what he was saying. But he was being totally guilty of Sabellianism. He was being a modalist. And he was quite, in that sense, he was quite wrong. But at the same time, we, th we sat there and thought, oh, that's quite helpful. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? Well, that's the yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do see what you're getting at. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. So, so many of the discussion about trend do seem quite helpful. Yes. But sometimes you realise they're wrong. I'm, I'm actually coming to analogies later on and say, well, how helpful are these? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately they're wrong. <laughs> yes, thanks. Thanks for the prompt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and that's difficult, but you can see why somebody would come up with something like that and say, well, this makes sense to me. I, I kind of, I think I get it, but you don't. Until they work it out to its logical conclusion. Yeah. 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 Until, until you figure out what that image is actually saying, you go, oh, no, it's not that. It's no. not. So but it, it helps you get your head around um, three different people being one person. Mm. Yeah, but I there's no it. three different people at that point. But we haven't got three no, different. Well, that, mm. well, no, we, we don't. Have yeah, you, you, you see that. But you yeah. 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 Three, three persons, yes. So you've actually got one person simply acting in three different mm. ways, mm. which mm. is not not really the, not quite the trinity at all. Quite the trinity on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Well, sorry, can I just... Yeah, please do. As soon as somebody starts with an analogy to explain the trinity, you're, you're lost. lost. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're lost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're lost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a hymn that just got a song. It's a song or a hymn? Hymn. We sent God in three persons, blessed, blessed trinity. Do it. Is that right or wrong? God in three persons, blessed trinity. That's quite right. right. That's right. But we'll come to why that's right later. Well, okay. Uh, when you... That, that preceding discussion triggered that in my brain. I thought, because it seemed to me that on the basis of that discussion, but no, that's, not, that's, that's not, not an analogy. Is that's it? not an analogy. That's just that's stating. That's a oh, statement. Okay. Oh. You know, it's like God in three persons. It's just like if. And right, that's where you go wrong. That's where you go wrong. If you just limit it to God in three persons, bless him truly. I did have a fellow who used to argue with me uh, from the Unitarian Church in Melbourne, and uh, he would turn up at the service. And uh, his, his, his big thing was um, how uh, John Calvin had persecuted the Unitarians in Geneva, which is historically true, actually. Mm -hmm. but, uh, What's wrong with that? But I said, well, <laughs> the trouble is when, <laughs> when we get involved in politics, this is the sort of thing that happens, yeah. isn't it? And uh, But he still sang there and sang with great gusto, God in three persons, bless the trial. <laughs> yes, and he didn't I, did, I did point it out to him, what it has been saying. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway. Uh, they don't, they just be, they don't believe in the Trinity at all. So it's Unitarianism. So it's, so it's one God, but it, it ultimately means that Jesus and the Holy Spirit aren't God, you see. Okay. <laughs> For them. 
So let's move on to, I think I've got to tell you next, here we are. So this is his way of putting it. And now you, the trouble is you've, you've now got to find words and this is the issue. Mm -hmm. So Tertullian's way of saying it is God is one being, substantial, but three distinct individuals persona. Those are the words he used to, tr to explain because Tertullian remained a strong Trinitarian um, in, in, his, in that um, uh, second century. Yeah, so so he's using words to explain it without going, yeah. trying to use an analogy to yeah. illustrate it. So that, that was his. And you'll see that the church starts doing that. Now, Oregon, okay, next. Oregon says, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are three persons. Now, this is hypostasis. This is the word he's using this time. But now here's an interesting one, because Oregon is a father of the church. And he says, the son is inferior to the father, the spirit is subordinate to both, which is touching on the sort of thing you say, but he's actually stating it, he's not, it's not just by default, he's a heretic. That, that was his <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, he's a heretic, just burn him down. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of our lectures, just burn him. Burn him. Oh, no, just... Bring in the faggots. What? Yeah, yeah. And you think you look up one of the switch pieces of wood. Yeah, bundles of Bundles of Jim. Bundles of Jim to start off. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we can, if we can, sort of get over burning heretics. Okay. What are we up to with that? Sorry. I mean, we we don't believe that, but but when we have again, we've always got to. Understand these are early church mm. fathers who have not really worked this out. Mm. So we've got the benefit yeah, mm. of, of their work. That's true. But, but it, we would we would say the spirit is sent by the Father and the Son. Yeah. Well, I was going to Must read, be. you know, it's okay. Uh, John uh, 14 would be an example, and verse 16. I will, this is Jesus says, I will ask the Father. And he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Now that that sounds like um, a certain a certain level of of hierarchy within the Godhead, doesn't it? When Jesus talks about doing the Father's will, mm. kind of thing, so you can understand where Oregon is coming from. Indeed, but. Oregon is is condemned. He is condemned as a heretic, but later. I condemned, and maybe condemned. Yes, I'd say that probably would work. Well, it's, it's he's identified. Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> I said, off. Oh, would you say the nice and crude, but we're okay, and you're all nodding. Well, the last bit of this is we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of Life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Yes. So, uh, how you view that word proceed, you could read that as being subordinate to the Father and the Son. Mm, but it is, it could, but it doesn't have to be. Really. No, 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 but it depends on you, on, yeah, because uh, yeah. English is an imperfect language, and yeah. it, of course, it's a star definition in English. Yeah. Yeah, so, what is proceed? The word in Greek or proceeds from is. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, I, I can't identify the Greek word from the Nicene Creed that is proceeds. So I must admit, yeah. no, but then that, that's that's pushing me a bit too. No, I didn't expect to say either. But <laughs> all I'm saying is that our, our English version of it could 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 mislead if if you read that. I, and I suspect proceed. probably the original maybe could be the same. I wouldn't be surprised. And here's the other one: is that I think the Anglo-Saxon word of God, whereas just on my reading, Yahweh uh, was used a number of different ways as far as Yahweh the creator. Uh, Yahweh is the father. Uh, you know, like our translation is just put... Don't we do the same? If, even in... Don't we, do we in our Yahweh, use of God do the same? Yahweh was the way to press precipitous word. Yeah. And then adjoined with other words. And it's not too surprising we, if we talk about, yeah, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses always, when they refer to God, call him Jehovah God, which is kind of the same thing, except it's the, 
it's the it, it's the Hebrew word made into an English word in yeah. the King James translation. Yeah, that's what they've done. Yeah. Um, and and so what do you but, think? We, but Yahweh we, is a Hebrew word specifically from the Old Testament. Yes. Why well, do you think we've moved away from that and and not used Yahweh or gone and you know, looked at how it was used in the original form? Why have we moved to the word God? Well, it, I mean, in, in the well, in the Old Testament, it was just four letters, wasn't it? The, the tetragrammaton. Right. It's Y H W H basically, yeah. or or J H V H if you yeah. prefer that. Um, and I think it becomes a technical word, and we tend to just substitute the word God. Do we? That's what I mean. It was technical in the old. I suppose. Yeah. In, okay. in its translation to all those derivations of Yahweh are now just being translated by the word God, Anglo Saxon God. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the simplification. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But we don't have the words, so we have to use what we've got. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's one of the language questions. You know, yeah, it's a language question. But, 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 but yeah. um, what I'm saying though is, are we losing those meanings because we have translated it to the word God mm. and, and not looked at the the complexity of the words of the use of the word Yahweh in different contexts? I, I, I think you're right, and I think I think often when we use the word God, we almost by implication mean Father. Mm. Mm. Would that not be so? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Can I Let just me, ask? Yes, sorry, you it. might have talked about it, but in verse 16, when he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, it's yeah. almost, I know it's not, it sounds like, oh, you th I think you need someone else. Yeah. yeah. But it's not meaning that, but it sort of, it's like he's the third. But the spirit, you know. I see what you mean in, in a hierarchy yeah, type of thing. Yeah, yeah. sort of. I, I mean, in, it is that you need someone else, mm. but it's but it's the full member of the Godhead. Mm. Oh, he is a full member. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, advocate, somebody who's going to speak for you. But it's sort of is this order. I, you need someone. I will ask. The yeah, father. that's like, that's that's right. But it, he was always going to. And I think that's what some of the early church theologians that that sort of thing is exactly what they were struggling mm. with. I think, I think what what we've got recorded for us mm. is made so people can understand, mm. try and understand. The wording is so people understand what's being said. And I don't think that we struggle with the Trinity. People back then would have struggled with mm. that kind of a concept, even before Jesus died. Especially especially people that are trained in um, philosophy and rhetoric and those sorts of things you you want to you want to be able to explain these things in human terms mm. don't you and, and i think humanity we we always put a hierarchy on things so it's kind of like i'll oh, ask means it's our nature yeah, yeah it's like oh i need permission mm. but i don't think it's that at all mm. and he will send as in oh he needs permission mm. it's not like Mm. He needs permission. It's kind of like they're working together. Mm. Whereas when we read these things, we automatically put our social our social constructs mm. of hierarchy mm. and authority mm -hmm. onto what we're reading when it yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be. And we've but, done that since the Adam and Eve story. Yeah. All the way yep. That's how we exist. Yeah. That's, well, that's how we yeah. interpret the world. Yes. Yeah. It's a so. And, and so, so we, we, we do need to, as much as we want to condemn some of these uh, church fathers, we do need to um, read them with a certain amount of grace. grace yes. I think we do. And yes. I think, it, in a sense, put ourselves into their world, which we can't do that either, but, you know, mm -hmm. at least to understand. Yeah. Yeah. I read them with grace. Something... And then I condemn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so before the Council of Nicaea, if I move on, before the Council of Nicaea, look, whether you spell that with the first A or not doesn't really matter, but that's 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 a I just copied in here. So, before the Council of Nicaea, 
all theologians appeared to view the sun as subordinate to the father. Okay, we get this. If you look like that, that appears to be how they see things before Nicaea. In the West, as we move on, in the West, they're strong on the unity of God and weak on the distinctiveness of the three. Mm -hmm. In the East, they're weak on the unity of God and strong on the distinctiveness of the three. That's, that's how it seems to have panned out as we, as we read the church fathers mm -hmm. in, in Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, and so on. Why couldn't the book have said that? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is so easy to understand, whereas this has taken 20 pages and I've gone, what's the difference? The book is, look, it, it, we've already, we had this discussion last week with Helen, actually. The, um, the, uh, the, the book, the course is so intense, and I think probably set at a higher level than it should be. I read it at least not thought as far as I'm going to get back in my life. Um, yeah. And part of our reason for meeting, I take it, is, is to help us a, at least to see a little a little bit more that's right. helpful to us. Yeah. So the, the, the issue with the, the Eastern view, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm close to, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, mm. is that given that they were strong on the distinctiveness of the three, mm. they subordinate the role of Jesus and the Holy Spirit mm. to the Father, which means that in, in essence, they're supporting, subordinating the, sal the sal saving work of Jesus in that respect. I don't think they are. I think probably they what they're doing is is they're bordering on three gods. Same thing in my I mean. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, I understand. And that and that was what some of them were accused of, by the way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wisdom, Jackie. Uh, it, it's easy to understand how they would think that. Of course. Three, I mean, they but could even so have to say so three so equals. So who saves us then under that? Period? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the saviour. The Holy Spirit is the confirmed and continues to. So they, in our walk. they would get that, but as they try to define. Excuse me, you've eaten. Is this your lunch turned up? This is me stirring him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that should be right there. Eat it while it's hot. Hello. Yeah. Well, it's hot. well, that'll keep him quiet for a while. Look at all that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that'll keep him quiet. <laughs> it's not for long. Not, no, I won't keep Gary quiet. You need to underline the uh, service that you get when you come to St. David's. That's it. Oh, we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, so so I mean that's just to say how it was looking, and and in terms of definition, then people get accused mm. of something, mm. and so the the accusation is I think I think you've got three gods here, mm. or the other accusation to the to those who have heard in the West, I I think. I don't think you've got three persons, probably. Mm. Mm. I um, think uh, faced with the Old Testament and then only witnessing Jesus for a short period of time mm. compared to the hundreds, if not thousands of years beforehand, mm. that God is so powerful. But, and then... Salvation comes through Jesus in this. The impact of his life is yet to be felt. Do you know what I mean? Uh, by the, the masses, those sure. that were converted. So you, you could see how they would create uh, the Almighty God, which is what the phrase we use, with all that had occurred before in the Old Testament. So, Am I wrong? Which is that? well, surely, yeah. I mean, this is but this is looking forward still to one who's coming, isn't it? As well, yeah. so, so there's a forward looking aspect in the Old Testament to this as well. Yeah. And it's interesting that the Old Testament that we do have the Spirit of God empowering people, yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. 
but okay. not you not not in quite the same mass way as Pentecost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think yeah, mm -hmm. and obviously the difference in the Old Testament was the Spirit would empower, but didn't resolve, abide. Mm. Would empower. Here we are. This is what I this is what I've got for you. So okay, this is what I've got for you. Gotcha. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've come to creeds and rules of faith. Yeah, creeds and rules of faith often reflected local or personal concerns. So Tertullian, for instance, says the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Tertullian has a particular high view of the Holy Spirit. He is a, a, a manichaeist uh, for a lot of his life. So they have an emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. So to so to so when Tertullian talks about the Trinity, he's he's then got quite an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, more than perhaps most of us. Yeah, with me with that. So, so, so church in church history, I say we we try not to get too deep into doctrine, but we really can't help it because it's a doctrinal issue. So we've got all God. Three distinct persons, but they interact with each other, so they can't be the one just operating in different modes. They relate in different ways, so we tend to think of Father, Creator, but it's not as simple as that. Because when we get to New Testament, we have the Son being Creator as well, and we tend to think of the Son, the one who sets us free, saves, redeems. And we think of the Holy Spirit that empowers and changes lives, don't we? That's, that, seems, that seems to be how it works. So they're distinct in relation to each other, like, your, like the diagram that came earlier, you know, is, is not, you know, is God, is not, they're not each, here we are, it's coming up there. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of diagram uh, that became helpful. And you'll find sometimes um, church stained glass windows in some places, mm. that sort of diagram uh, to, to try and be Trinitarian. And that's right, but it doesn't necessarily explain the Trinity. Mm. Okay, so they're, they're all God, and there are certain scriptures which will support all that, um, which I think I will uh, not, not go into right now. I've moved to the Council of Nicaea, and most of you will know by now that that was in 325 AD, had originally been planned to be in Nicomedia and was moved to Nicaea. Um, Constantine, and we talked about Constantine last week, thought it's actually a very nice place by the seaside with lovely fresh air, and uh, that's what we're going to do it. That, that, look, I know that that's, for, that's effectively what he said. Time's so changed, Yeah. yeah. Better now. Nice. <laughs> so we know very little about the proceedings. Emperor Constantine himself presided at the opening session, so he went along himself to preside at the Council of Nicaea. And of about 220 bishops present, they were just about all from the east. There were a couple uh, from Italy. I think there might have been a couple from Britain as well. But basically, they were nearly all from the east. It, it, was, it was really in the east, and it was really an eastern council. One thing I read about, one of the interesting things I read, was that uh, there could have been a lot more people there. I mean, theoretically, there could have been you know, a few hundred. There's more yeah. than 300, I mean, a few hundred. One because they aimed at income or didn't go over. It wasn't the fact that they were in unified thing that it laid out to be. But, but every time they had a council, no matter how many people were in it, they, they all agreed with it in the end, in the sense of whatever decisions were made. They yeah. wanted oh, over these years, there were dozens, mm -hmm. scores of councils, a lot of which we've never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and we've really only heard of Nicaea because of the Nicene Creed, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. So the council produces its own creed, and this is to exclude Arian heresy, and we call it the Creed of Nicaea, and it's not the Nicene Creed. Okay. <laughs> just because, yeah. Yeah, just to make it very clear. <laughs> well, Pickles, I've written it down. That was, that was was later, wasn't it? Can we yes. do the Nicene Creed that we have now as later? Yes. Yeah. Got to get a confirmation at this stage. 
What was the East? What was the West? Ah, oh, the East basically was the um, was based. Well, later it was based on Constantinople. Constantinople but at yeah. the moment, it's based on uh, Nick and Media. It's not that far from Istanbul, actually. But yeah. so you've got the West is going to be um, Greece. Uh, Italy, of course, yes. based on Rome and over to France, even over to Britain. And the East is is going to be what we would call Asia Minor, so yes. Turkey and beyond, over to Antioch, over to Syria, and North Africa. North Africa. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. so, uh, and they are two separate. That's right. They've got two different emperors, remember, mm, at this that's time. That's right. This is when the Roman Constantine's. Two different emperors, yeah. Yeah, Constantine is. Um, I, I mean, he's actually Emperor of the West. Beg your pardon? He's Emperor of the West, yeah. Constantine. Yeah, but you, you, you have more and more, when people talk about the Roman Empire, more and more it's shifting to the East. Very much shifting to the East, but under Constantine, That's right. it unites again mm -hmm. in, what year did I say, three? 25. 25, we've seen, I've seen three. That's the Nicene Creed, but okay. it actually it, it actually unites. Um, I'm just thinking round about that time. Is it three thirty or something? Something like that. It unites again. I'll, I'll probably come to it. Okay. Now this is it. Let's. If I read it, and you can tell me what uh, some comments. We believe in one God, the Father uh, Almighty, Maker of all things visible and invisible. Stop there. That seems good. I'm okay with that. You're okay with that. Yeah. Now that, what is that it? is the bit of the creed that refers to the creator, the father. That's so what, it. Just what? one sentence, not even a sentence. So what does invisible mean? Oh, you tell me. You can't see. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> not that I can't understand. <laughs> I can't see it. It, it does read as if God the one God is the yeah. Father. Okay, all right. So, so let's so, go on. Well, Shahe, you wanted a, a, the answer to you, Lewis, when you say well, visible and invisible. All right. Physical and spiritual. Yeah. So is, is, are we talking the heavenly realms? Or yes, yeah. invisible, invisible is the heavenly realm, and, and visible is, is and earthly realm. So this is purely from a human perspective, it's not from a God perspective. Yeah. Because he's, he's it's, our, it's our attempt to try and it's, understand what God does. is. It's, 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 covering, it's covering all Everything. things. Yes. Yeah. And it it's doesn't make it It's invisible. Yeah. It doesn't make just it so, just substitute everything and you've got it. Everything you can see, everything, everything you can see, and everything you can't. So, see. so does that mean that although I'm not in England, mm -hmm. that would be invisible? No, no. England's invisible. No. Does it not by me? If I'm making a statement, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to work it out. Is it purely anything on Earth? Physical. 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 I think it basically. If I go into space, I can see things. How are we going to write this down? How are we going to make it clear? Mm -hmm. yeah. God is created. Yes. We're covering all things. Yeah, yeah, that's good. But it's, but it's making, what I said. I said everything. It's making the father as the creator. Mm -hmm. Then it's it including have a role for and also the, the son God. or the Holy Spirit. Then it's including the non-visible world mm -hmm. as well as the visible. But the next but that's sentence, not just the spiritual. Next sentence, because it can be love. It can be uh, all those things. Everything. No, no, no. You got. Okay. You got a problem. So look, I'm, right. I'm going to leave us with the bigness of all that. Yes. Okay, and move on. Now Jesus gets. Rather a he longer, a good, he gets a good. Right. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is, from the very substance, is now the, the word Uzi comes up, the very substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, very God from very God, begotten, not made, yeah. of one substance, homo. Uzios, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made. So we've got that in again. Yeah, that, yeah. Both in heaven and on earth, who for us, we've left out the word men in our modern renditions of this one, who for us and for our salvation came down and was incarnate, which means human, human or has a body, yeah, and That's was special. made man suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is coming to judge the living and the dead. 
Does so it say he actually died? Well, he suffered and rose again. Rose again. For is what? that the inference to death? So this is trying to also well, establish. It doesn't actually spell it out. It's not just about establishing the Trinity. It's also establishing the fact that Christ became incarnate. Yes. Because that debate beforehand was about, yes. about the, whether it yes. was Christ yes. really flesh. Or was he? Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. 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 Have to deal with that. And, and, you know, the schools of thought, uh, you know, one says, well, he... Um, he must be a man, you know, he's a man, he can't be God. And one says, well, he's God, he can't be man. And we're saying, well, he's incarnate and he's God. We say, yeah, in fact, he's both. Yeah. Um, the, I think now, does the Nicene Creed, the actual Nicene Creed put, puts about him descending to the dead? I have, I have, I have to hear from Ray and Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. So what it says, it's, uh, all right, so this is about, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. So that's the same word again. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit gets a Guernsey now. He became incarnate, incarnate of the, from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again into glory to judge the living and the dead, and his, and his kingdom will have no end. So, so it's, it's virtually it's, an embellishment of that. It's, yeah, to, it's it, it, so it, mm. that mm. question you had about, did he die? Mm. They just fixed it now. Yeah. Right. A few years later. And interesting, the Pontius Pilate gets the Guernsey. Oh, yeah, he gets yeah. the Guernsey. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a bit grim, isn't it? Forever. To anchor it in history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But look at the third one. Look at the next. Yeah. And in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the third. Stop. So that's all you get? Five words. Yeah. Except yeah. probably didn't. No, but it doesn't say there. Oh, no, there's the whole paragraph. I thought, I thought it was the By the time we get the... By the time we get to the council, uh, the, the council of Constantinople, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it. Gets a good, good news, yeah. Now, what, there's, a, there's a writer at the end of this that says this. Those who say there was a time when he was not, and before he was, for, before he was begotten, he was not, and he came into being from nothing, or those who pretend that the Son of God is of another substance, hypostasis, or essence, usia, than the Father, or created, or mutable, the Catholic and Apostolic Church places under a curse. Oh, wow. So you cannot say these things. What does mutable mean? Changeable. Changeable. Liable to change. Yeah. 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 So, you're going so to be we can't music. say there was a time when he was not. Yep. Yeah. And we can't say he came into being from nothing because he always was. And we can't say that Jesus or the Son is of another substance or essence than the Father. We can't say that Jesus was created. Yeah, we have to we have to go with the unchanging God that we believe in. Here we are, the Catholic and Apostolic Church places under a curse. So we, that's that's how they see all of it. The good part there, I think, is they don't say to kill them. Just, uh, you know, either they're an apostate Cur or... Yeah, so curse is a... The curse? curse is a funny... Well, we put them... The, the, just just a curse, I suppose. It's, I mean, what's a curse? It's kind of the opposite of a blessing. Yes. Mm. They're not under God's blessing, they're under God's curse. Ah, oh, God's I think that. Mm, I think so. I think that's the way I would read it. More, more timber. <laughs> I think maybe we we do we do tend to use the word curse that way, but I think they're using the word curse as you know you're not going to enjoy the blessings of the church. All right. Okay. So that's straight after the Nicene Creed, didn't that? It was it was a split anyway, wasn't it? Look, this <laughs> splits. I mean, it just basically. But it was addressed basically to one person, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. But Arius. Was well, we've got Arius now. Arius. Okay. Yeah. So this is who this is who Arius is. Yeah, just just a bit about him. So he's <laughs> the president of a church in Alexandria. 
which is in the east, right, um, in Africa, as you know, still exists. Beautiful city, actually, if you look at it. Oh. They've got a, a brand new, magnificent library. Oh, the old one was one of the seven wonders. That's right. right. Yeah. Before, but they've got a brand new one. It's, it's not the old one back. Mm. Sorry, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm digressing. About 318, Arius challenges the teachers in Alexandria. He asserts that the word who became flesh was not true God. So that's his assertion. The Bishop of Alexandria at the time is called Alexander. And Alexander, I think, tries to deal with it. Okay. Jesus Christ, he asserts, had an entirely different nature, neither eternal nor omnipotent. Okay. Therefore, when Christians called Christ God, they did not mean he was a deity, except in an approximate sense. So is this where the JW's are coming from? Get that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. He is then a lesser being, a created being, the first and the greatest, but created. So, in other words, Aris is saying, he is a human being. He is a man. He is a very, very, <coughs> very, very, very amazingly good man. But he's a man. So the classic Arian statement is there is a time when he was not. Yes. That's the classic. That's right. Mm. So Arius writes to the Bishop of Nicomedia. Now, the Bishop of Nicomedia is our friend Eusebius. Mm. The sun has a beginning. But God is without beginning. No, that says it how he sees it. Okay, we got that? Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, calls a synod. Now, it's not a synod that we know particularly well. It's more yeah. a council of, uh, of sort of African, um, well, no, um, North African bishops, kind of, uh, and... Uh, so he calls that that synod, and Arius is condemned, then an execute, uh, excommunicated, excommunicated, excommunicated. So that's three twenty. So we're five years before Nicaea, and Arius wins the backing of his friend Eusebius, who's bishop of Nicomedia. So Eusebius isn't perhaps the goody goody that you thought he was. No, this isn't Eusebius the historian. It is yeah, Eusebius. Eusebius. Like it is Eusebius the historian. Now he kind of backs Arius. The, so now we've got Nicomedia and Alexandria in conflict because the Bishop of Alexandria is Trinitarian and the Bishop of Nicomedia is, well, probably not in the way we would understand it. Oops, I missed it. Three points. Um, there, um, where are we? Arius yes, there. Sorry? I missed three points on the PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Arius returns to Alexandria. Oh, Arius wins the backing of his friend, you see, who's the bishop. No, I keep going the next one. Oh, sorry. I've missed them on the slides. Arius returns to Alexandria um, because, I mean, he's, his friends have presumably travelled with him to uh, Nicomedia. And apparently riots erupt in the street. So, so people are very passionate about this. Um, so, so hang on, they're, they're rioting because well, Alexander, Alexander is very is a Trinitarian. Yes, so, so they're upset with, with Arius, or I would say so. Yes. Oh, no. But Arius has got his friends there. So he five years later at Nicaea, he defends his views, and he says this. The Son of God was created. He was capable of change, both good and evil. That, that's, that's the only way, really, he can, he can, I think, support the position that he's come to. But if he's fully human. Yes, fully flawed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He had little support. It appears that Eusebius was not quite so enthusiastic about his support of Arius after all. And, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of 
trying to play it both ways. You're my mate, but <laughs> yeah, we so, always yeah. play the wind was blown. Yeah. So is Eusebius trying to set up some position of power or something? No, I don't think so. I think Eusebius was, was trying to be a mediator. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think that, Eusebius that was, was trying, trying to be friends with both sides. Trying to be friends with both. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Turkey, that's what it was. Now that we all know that within society and within the church, there are those of there are those of us who will try and do that. But sometimes, if you're dealing with heresy, you, you have to take a stand. Mm -hmm. That's all. Maybe you see this wasn't really listening when Aris spoke to him. In the well, remember, he hadn't gone through this massive history. Aris has come up with this uh, a few years earlier, and it's really becoming a huge problem in the church. So, as I put, however, Arianism did not die. And in fact, it flourished in places. Which um, now, there were joint councils. I'm sort of adding this because in three, this is much later, in 359, there was a council at Rimini and there's another one at Sonoma. And uh, there were kind of an attempt to have a double council, one on the coast of Italy and one on the coast of Turkey mm -hmm. at the same time. Did they? And um, they finished up with a very wishy-washy definition, which said something like, the son is like the father. Uh -huh. And that was... That's trying to keep everybody happy. Which was trying to keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. Did that influence the Coptic Church? I'm not sure. I think the, the Coptic Church, as far as I understand, has remained very Trinitarian. The, yeah. the Coptic Church had bigger things to deal with ultimately or the or the african church uh, did ultimately and um, and and not much after this actually in the, in the fifth and century in of I just know that, uh, and then later with this one 600 of the students at three and to harris and uh, the coptic girl in the same class they often debated about things like the uh, trinity the, the big deal for the Eastern Church, including the Coptic Church, mm -hmm. uh, was still, I mean, this is much, this is later, mm -hmm. was the Holy Spirit. Is it proceeding from the Father or proceeding from the Father and the Son? And it's called Filioque. Um, I won't get into that. No, but, fair enough. But Jerome made the comment after these councils, um, when we don't get to, Jer we do Jerome next week, right? The whole world groaned in astonishment at finding itself Aryan. That was what Jerome said. Great right work saying it. But next week we see that um, clearly there were individuals who stood up for the Nicene, for the Trinitarian faith, and in general succeeded. Yeah. But they were often, it was often a very lonely road for them. It's um, it's Sorry, I'm just trying to think. Because um, I'm in uh, obviously some Facebook groups, but one of them, are, I know it's nerdy Christian things, but there was, they, they put in a, a cartoon that I, I was supposed to laugh at. So it's some kid sitting on Santa's knees going, so, Homoousian or Homoousian? And Santa goes, what? And he goes, you're not the real St. Nicholas. Yes. <laughs> so was St. Nicholas somehow involved in this debate, allegedly? They believe that Nicholas went to Myra. I haven't, and he doesn't, I don't think he comes up particularly in the thing, but Nicholas of Myra, I understand, did go to, uh, did go to Nicholas, okay. yeah, and was a Trinitarian. Yeah, that's why I should laugh at that. Did he slap somebody? Did he slap someone? Did he slap, did he slap somebody at this point? Mm. He was he, he was he was based in Myra, which is sort of in, again modern day Turkey. Big big in the Russian Church, Nicholas. Oh, huge yeah. in the Russian That's Church. Why all the named mm. Nicholas. Mm. And uh, and they go on pilgrimages to Myra. So you see that and leave little handwritten down. notes oh, in what they think is to to, to pray for them. Well, so you come up, up, so when he comes up and reads them and. <laughs> I've, I'm not sort of going to that sort of. I'm yeah. just telling you what they do. I I I watch them by so-called grave, writing little notes, dropping them over the first fix cover into Saint Nicholas's tomb. Except the guides are adamant that they've got the wrong place, but neither does it matter. <laughs> and they they're writing handwritten notes to pray for things, 
pray to Saint Nicholas for things. That that would be for needy relics, presumably. Yeah. In the main end. So who gets to read the notes? Well, well, Nicholas. I don't know what they do. Night when there's nobody there, and he opens the <laughs> like, and he reads them all, then he puts them back. Which is funny in a way because I like, don't think Nicholas, from having read about him, and there are a number of the legends written about him, I don't think he would have had a bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go on. The Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, Cappadocia is a province in modern day Turkey, and it's still called Cappadocia. And it's quite a tourist place because lots of caves and things around it, yeah. balloon flights over it, but not then. If you Google Cappadocia, which I was for those slides, <laughs> every most of the images are balloons over yeah. Cappadocia. <laughs> so it's big. So it's a, yeah. it's a it's a place to go on holiday. Okay, Cappadocia. And the three, the Cappadocian fathers are these three guys. Basil, Basil. and two <laughs> Gregories. <laughs> Basil. That's an unfortunate name, isn't it? Only the Alpha. Well, I don't think it was. The rabbit, them, I, think they, I think they thought it was a very noble name. Right. Heavy. And, uh, Even ended up in the rabbit too. Yeah, we, we make fun of it. Yeah, Basil. So let's let's just a quick a quick overview of Basil. Born about three thirty into a wealthy Christian family, well educated, studied in Athens from three five one. Met Gregory of Nazianzus. On returning home, taught rhetoric, was baptized, and led a monastic life. Now, the, the monasticism is starting to become something about this time. He set up his own monastic community, was appointed presbyter, 364, then bishop at Caesarea. He devoted himself to social schemes for the poor and the fight against Arianism, okay, dying in 379. And he left. Oh, he left quite a bit of stuff for us to read. So that's about Now, he wasn't very old when he finished. Now, Greg, the first Greg, the first Greg, Gregory of Nazianzus. He looks a bit healthier than Basil. Oh, he looks okay, doesn't he? He's got a luxuriant beard there. And he's also from a noble Cappadocian family. His father was Bishop of Nazianzus. He met Basil in Athens and became his follower. His father appointed him as a presbyter in Nazianzus, but this was largely a failure. I could imagine this, you know, dad says, you're going to be the presbyter, I'm the bishop. <laughs> um, eventually he became bishop of the Nicene party in Constantinople. He preached five famous theological orations, defending Nicene orthodoxy and played a leading role at the council of Constantinople in 381. He was a victim of ecclesiastical rivalries and resigned his position. He died in three, around about 389, 390. So when that's Greg of Nazianzus. When was he born? Um, I haven't uh, thought of that, have I? It it's might say in the book. He, he'd have been born, I would think, in the 330s. Okay. So that was the same age as Basil. So, yeah. yeah. Might have been a bit younger, younger. bit younger maybe. Younger. But he was in Athens at the same time, so he could have been much younger. So he was probably never as old as Dmitri. Yeah. Sorry? No, they aged early. The, yeah, I, you, you read about the ages of these guys and you think, oh my goodness, yeah. So 329. 329, okay, there we are. So he was a year, he was a year older than, he, than, he, than Basil. Yeah. Yeah. Often, you, you do understand in these days, often the, the year of their birth is quite a bit of guesswork. Yeah. yeah. So you, you can all, you, know, you can usually identify the year of their death, but year of their birth yeah. is often guess. I think the, the word follower is a bit of a tricky one too. I'm a year older than Ken. Yeah, just can I, but what I mean is you're not a follower in the sense that you no, you learn true. from them that you oh, you're running yeah. parallel. Well you you know yeah, you yeah, agree yeah. with them and they yeah. like a follow-up. The, the, the implication yeah. and we'll see with Greg of Nyssa as well, the implication is that while he was around Basil was the one who who did oh, the heavy lifting. He's a little brother. So Gregory of Nyssa was Basil's brother. And so he's a bit younger, born 335. He was an intellectual and taught rhetoric. Although married, he later also pursued a monastic life. And I don't know what he did with his wife. Understandable. Basil to... persuaded some, some of the references used the word bullied, 
Basil persuaded him into becoming Bishop of Nyssa in 371, though for a while he was replaced by an Arian, but he was a distinguished defender of Christian orthodoxy, died in about 394. He remained Bishop of Nyssa all that time, by the way, but people got deposed and replaced and sent into exile in those days and came back. And that's the continual story of the whole group of people that we learn about next week. So does this, these positions reflect the change in power and structures that are happening in the empire? I think they probably reflect the change. Yeah, they do. But I think also they reflect the, the, the power of structures of, well, within individuals who, who have that sort of personality, which, which will try to move people about and do things like that. Like, like in the even um, even here up to what 20, 30 years ago, a bishop, for instance, would come and say, "You're you're going there." Mm. Couldn't do it now. Well, <laughs> well, it's a bit like that in Africa, mm. in, in Tanzania. Mm. The bishops have a okay. sort of power. Okay. Okay. But, and now, of course, they, they would do it. I oh, probably better be careful because I'm being recorded on. Now they keep talking. Now they <laughs> now they now they'd probably do it by sort of making it worth making it difficult for you to stay yes. if they if they were had that sort of mindset. Now the bishop, the the archbishop in Sydney has been known to say no mm. when yeah. churches say we want this person of our best way. Yeah, has been known to just go no. Yeah, mm. try again. Yeah, mm. and in nominations to the bishops. And kind of lean on the nominators and go, this is not really good. Yeah, the bishop does something. Yeah. Well, you, yes, you've you do something like that. Yeah. Please look at this person. Yeah. You know, they do that. Yes. yes. So yes. they will advise you strongly yeah. because I'm desperate to find a spot for them. Do you yeah. really want to? Yeah. 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 That's, that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. Let's, no, no, let's no, move on. Still has the final say. Yeah. Yeah. No. The fact that. Um, Gregory of Nicaea, venerated uh, as a saint in Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, Anglicanism, and Lutheranism. So he made it across a lot of different religions, didn't he? They're, they're, they're very important in... Sorry? All from the same origin. They're yeah. very important in the history. Variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially the Eastern Church. Mm -hmm. well, if I move on, because I, I realize that we've still got a chunk here, the Cappadocians are particularly remembered for their opposition to Arianism and their teaching on the Trinity. They brought together the Nicene belief that Father and Son are homoousios, one substance, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three hypostases or beings, which they got from all of them. So the okay. Spirit is not from the same substance? Ah, um, yes, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are, yes, uh, well, uh, I'll come to that because <coughs> Nazianzus actually has something to say about that, which I think I've got down. The distinction between ousia and hypostasis is the same as that between, this is, this is Basil says this, now I think we might not agree with this in time. The distinction between Uzi and hypostasis is the same as that between the general and the particular, as, for instance, between the animal and the particular man. The Godhead is common, the fatherhood particular. We must therefore combine the two and say, I believe in God the Father. We must combine the particular with the common and say, I believe in God the Son. So in the case of the Holy Ghost, I believe also in the divine Holy Spirit. There's a satisfactory preservation of the unity by the confession of the one Godhead, while in the distinction of the individual properties regarded in each, there is the confession of the peculiar properties of the persons. So he's make, he's emphasizing that the, the oneness, and, and that's where he uses the word usia, and he's distinguishing that from the particular. Now, what he seems to be saying is a little bit like um, uh, Lewis, in general, is a human being, but in particular, he's Lewis. 
I th that's 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 a sort of analogy he's trying to draw. But as we read on, he doesn't really seem to mean quite that. Hmm. Okay, so so doesn't. that was yeah. that was his way of trying to put it. Um, and he's saying the Holy Spirit is divine, yeah, and the Son God. is also God. So it's God the Father, God the Son, but the divine Holy Spirit. Well, again, whether he means something different is, is debatable, but he doesn't seem to have had a special theology of the Holy Spirit. Of yeah, well, when we read what Nazianzus says, we, um, we'll see that well, he, he, he lives longer than that. <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, this is Nazianzus, I think, that I've tried to quote here. When I speak of God, you must be enlightened at the same time by one flash of light and by three. Oh, it's lost it right now. There are three individualities or hypostasis, or if you prefer, persons. There is one substance, deity, for God is divided without division and united in division. Now, don't you think that's clever? <laughs> divided without division and united in division? Don't you think that's brilliant? Well, no, sorry. So be married all the others. Well, what he's doing is saying you can't explain it. Sure. Mm. The Godhead is one in three and three in one. We must neither heretically fuse God together into one, which is monarchianism, yeah, mm -hmm. nor chop him up into inequality, which is Arianism. So well done, Greg. He's trying, isn't he? That's yeah. why he's got a grey beard. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they, like... they all look like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a a dish. Dish. <laughs> it's a dish. I just a dish. That divided without division and then united in division. Mm. But if there's no division, is there no unity? But he's, but he's just trying to say it's both. But there is unity. Yes, there is. That's what he's it says trying united to say. in division, but there is no division because it's divided. Uh, okay, so you're you're using logic. <laughs> <laughs> if A plus B, then yes. equals C. Yes, Mathematical. And that's and yes. that's when 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 you engage your Jehovah's Witness friends who aren't coming to the door so much these days, uh, they will. They will tell you it's illogical. Uh, can, can I much read, read the first? That's their thing. argument. Read the first two <laughs> sentences. As he says, he says the, yeah. there are three individuals, or, or he said, if you prefer persons, right, but one substance. Yeah. So he's trying to explain that in words that we understand. That, that people yeah. would understand. Exactly. There is division, but no division. There is, yeah. So we've. There is unity, yeah. but it's divided. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he's trying to say. But it's not the same. It's not the same as saying, you know, the, the Matildas are one team. But, you know, so-and-so scored the goal. Yeah. It's not the same as that. In, but that does seem to be a little bit what Basil is saying. Let's go to Greg of Nyssa. We do not learn that the father does anything on his own without the cooperation of the son. So now we get an interaction, you see. Um, nor does the son, no, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Right. Oh, no, you're right. No, sorry, you're right. Nor does the son act on his own without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity affects every act, not by separate action according to the number of persons, but so that there is one motion and disposition of the good will that proceeds from the Father through the Son to the Spirit. So we cannot call those who jointly, inseparably, and mutually exercise divine superintending power and activity to us and all creation, we cannot call them three gods. I like this guy. Mm -hmm. That's Should I like this guy? That, oh, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Just checking. That's why yeah. this is the same. Right. I, they all are. Oh, no, but this one got recognized by heaps. 
I think they're all of denominations. So I think oh, look up two St. Gregory's in the Eastern yeah. Church. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, the Next Gregory Voyager. Gregory appears, as you may well know, throughout history from time to time as something or other. And we have to identify which Gregory we're actually talking about. Oh. Uh, last week, we had a Gregory the Illuminator, who was the person responsible for making um, Armenia a Christian country. 301 AD. There you go. So the story tells Allegedly. us. Allegedly. But you read last week's notes about that. Okay. The Cappadocians were accused of suggesting that there are three gods mm -hmm. and also the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so you, oh. yeah, one person acting in three different ways, which you remember uh, is Sabellianism. So they used analogies, but understood they were limited and not totally accurate so could be misleading. They taught that the three persons interpenetrate each other. Is the spirit God? Most certainly, says Gregory of Nazianzus. Well then, is he consubstantial of the same substance? Yes, if he is God. They taught that the spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, the presence of God in our generation. So that's, that's the presence of God. We got that? The presence of God with us. Now I went on to analogies because I know that they're around and we've already discussed analogies oh. and we probably don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> but the um, the analogies have the ones that I I have and I you know I remember a guy coming out to from the congregation and said, look, I've really got I've really got this Trinity bit. It's the, and it's meant to the, give you an analogy? It's the, yeah, plans yeah. And the, it's, it's the plans and the flower and the sap. And I'm sorry, Brian. It's uh, okay. Um, but, but the answer, I think, as uh, Gary said um, uh, an hour ago, was if somebody says, I've, I've really got a handle on the Trinity, I understand it. You know they're wrong. Well, well, uh, <laughs> as soon as I try and come up with an analogy to help yeah. you understand. Yeah. What about yeah. a three leaf? And I just I the three leaf coat, the three leaf clover. Leaf that was Patrick. That was Patrick. Um, <laughs> Saint Pat, sorry, to be sure. <laughs> but yeah, well, we've, that's that's tritheism, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and yeah, but those are some they are. So some are what what they would describe as partialism, which is like the A one, or modalism, which is the three forms of the same thing, and so it goes on. And they always create misunderstanding and a heresy. Now, the, the question really is, how far are analogies helpful? Gary says they're not helpful at all, ever. Okay. Well, in terms of the Trinity. In terms of the Trinity. <laughs> Might they sometimes be helpful as long as we get that they are totally imperfect? Well, well, that's true. I think people get they can envision, envision something in their head about what it should, may look like, or just kind of understand what it might look like. But then uh, the understanding that it's not a perfect analogy. If you're that's, helping, you can find issues yeah. with it. if you're helping somebody to make a decision for Christ, mm -hmm. and they ask that question, mm -hmm. you may have to use an analogy to explain it to them. But to say, look, this is not perfect, but yeah, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. but, but you but you have to say it falls short somewhere it's got yeah. to but i don't think you, jackie's example is somebody it's learning huge, about christianity huge, yeah. you don't want to make it too complicated no i think if the three I, clover is perfect um, well, well i was going to say if i had to choose one from this list here yeah. this isn't a uh, list of uh, no 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 this, uh, they, <laughs> but if i had to choose one I would, I, get, I would choose the second one Water. Yeah, water. Yeah, I thought that would be. I know, Gary, you choose none. I know that. We know that. Well, I, 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 then, I then go to my, my favorite philosopher, Wittgenstein, who said if we our language doesn't have the sufficient words to describe the smell of coffee, then we should shut up. I, Basically, that's on that's what Wittgenstein. I, I think what I come to with all this moral philosopher yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is don't get too anxious about it don't get too hung up about it I, I think i think that's what i come to this this is a really important part of church history we're studying early church history we're going to come across this stuff we can't avoid it if we're going to do doctrine we come across it we can't avoid it but i'd say don't get too worried about that yeah fair enough <laughs> yeah.
So, although, uh, oh, no. so oh, go on. So, yes. <laughs> well, it's working with you know amongst um, Muslims, sure, yeah, and trying to you know yeah. have that conversation about three gods, yes, and. You can't just sit there and say, no, you're wrong, and then try and go from scripture. You actually have to use something practical yes. that's tangible for them. Yep. Doesn't necessarily explain everything about who Jesus is, who God the Father is. Well, is tell me if this next bit, not not this next absolute bit, but a couple of paragraphs yeah. down, tell me if that's helpful. So I, I just put, do you know any others and how might they be useful under certain circumstances? And some of us would say they wouldn't be useful anyway, but under certain circumstances, well, you never know. Okay, the Cappadocians tried to make them more personal. And I think one of their objections to it was they, they were impersonal. So the Cappadocians tried to make them more personal by using relationships like father, mother, child. Guess, guess which one gets the mother? Yeah. Jesus. No, Jesus gets the child. Yeah. Sure. The spirit. The spirit gets them. The spirit gets the mother. Oh, really? really? So the father. Through the caring one. Throughout, throughout, throughout Catholic, throughout Roman Catholic history, this, they attempt to present the Holy Spirit as feminine. Mm -hmm. I have no problem. Well, Leads into Marianism, uh, as in saying Mary is divine. But anyway. Oh, I don't okay. see why. Now here we are. Oh, I actually I this, is I I, this is what I this is what I put now. Tell me about this, and this this might be the true foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Is that God acted in history, revealing Himself to Israel? Yeah. God acted in history, entering our world as Jesus of Nazareth, dying and rising for our salvation. God acted in history at Pentecost to share the life of and empower and equip the Christian church, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is that the, uh, is that then sort of saying God didn't act in any other? No, it's not. But it's saying that our, generally our knowledge of creator is the God who reveals himself to his ancient people, particularly in a lot of it to Israel. But not only Israel. No. And and that's that but what we know of God's saving work is when God reveals himself as the Son, mm -hmm. as Jesus. And what we know of God's uh, empowering and equipping work through the church is the Holy Spirit. Have a think about it. And different parts of the church, of course, will see the work of the Holy Spirit um, with different emphases. So does that mean that we put God the Father and Jesus in park mode while the Spirit does everything? Not. We want to. That's what's sort of being inferred, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I would, I, well, I don't think it is being inferred particularly, but I think that's that's a way of seeing the work of the three persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a further revelation of God, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If we think of God as three, then we must account for God's unity. If we think of God as one, then we must not be vague about His threeness. And Alan will now sing to us. I'm just uh, just quickly because we can finish here. I think um, it's three. Thirty one's a big year. There's a lot of stuff. There's a huge lot of stuff. I don't, I, I know I keep repeating that, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to let you know that I get it. <laughs> Council of Constantinople 381 called by Theodosius. Now, Theodosius is now the emperor, right? To deal with Arianism in the Eastern Church, it's still not been finished with. Both the Gregories are there playing a leading role. 
the resulting creed is a clear forerunner or early version of the Nicene Creed. Ready? Ready. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate from the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and is coming again with glory to judge living and dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life. But those who say there was when the Son of God was not, and before he was forgot, begotten he was not, and that he came into being from things that are not, or that he is of another substance or essence, or that he is mutable or alterable, the Catholic. I'm reading the same one. You Sorry. Were after the Nicene Creed. Oh, mad. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one substance with the Father through through whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate from the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and rose the third day according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and is coming again with glory to judge both living and dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is jointly worshipped and jointly glorified, who spoke through the prophets in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That's virtually the Nicene Creed. That's Constantinople. Yeah. It's an early version. Yeah. It's astounding because it bounces through various parts of scripture. Mm. Back and that's forth. True. Yeah. It's interesting to see to the right hand, isn't it? Because that's that's kind of Hebrews for that sort of thinking, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we go to created Genesis through to Revelation and judgment, back to you know, the gospels for uh, the account of Jesus forward to Acts and wherever for the yeah. uh, Holy Spirit goes, whatever. Um, but they've certainly yeah. made more clear the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've also included the, um, the idea of the, you know, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. I found whenever I took, uh, say, a, a baptism service, um, and I found, or, or any other service, when, when we did say the Nicene Creed, and there was a church full of non-Christians, that there were two words I always had to explain and always did before we said the creed. And one's the word Catholic, Catholic. Mm -hmm. and one's the word saints. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what was the second one? Saints. Okay. Saints. Like your the communion team. of saints. Yeah. It's like your football team. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, where I was, there was a football team called the Saints. There was. But 381, there, isn't it more that um, just from my previous studies, was it was more about unifying the churches mm. uh, under the one creed uh, and to send that out as. A, a unifying creed amongst 
East and West. This, this is what we believe, but it's an attempt, particularly by the emperor at the time, Theodosius, yes. to deal with Arianism once and for all. Yeah, to stamp it out and, and yeah. have them sing from the same but, hymn book. Yeah, so which, 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 which does the Newton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've just put the three heresies that were condemned there, which you can see for yourselves, I think. Um, Arianism, Apolli mm, Apollinarianism. Okay, so Jesus wasn't you. Now, that, that definition of Arianism, is that correct? You know, I just thought that did seem to sound right to me. What's that? The definition of Arianism. You know, no, that's the, that's the creed. Condemning. 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 Oh, sorry, yeah. that makes more sense. Not to yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, and that's what Apollinarius are doing. The Macedonian, yeah, they walked out, the Macedonians, because they uh, they considered the, they were okay as far as the father and the son were concerned, but didn't really consider the Holy Spirit to be part of the deal with the Holy Spirit. So they were Macedonians. So when they came up with that, they all walked out. <laughs> so, so they did. So they believed that the son was eternal. Yes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they were part of the Arians no, no, no. because the, no. the Spirit yeah. created Jesus. <laughs> Look, it's the same as today. There are there are little things that that will separate us. I mean, there are, there are big things that that people form different denominations yes. for the the silliest of reasons. Mm -hmm. is, is that is, is that really the crux? I, I mean, I. I I'm fascinated by the how to say intellectual uh, endeavor to mm. try and sort of piece together what we believe, but there's a sense of humility that seems to be missing with yeah, a theology that gets developed. Mm. And I, you know, it's okay to think about it. It's another thing to have it tested and then to acknowledge the yeah, I really am not behind because that reflects the disciples, the apostles. Yes, you know, they missed the point. And Jesus had to correct them. Mm -hmm. And despite sort of then giving them a bit of a, a whack, he did love them and brought them back in, and then they understood. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, humility. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because uh, some of those early church fathers are, are, are really very dominant, bossy, dogmatic, mm -hmm. um, and what have you. And I think they feel the need to be. Um, so I, I don't know how history treats people who are. Yeah, maybe a bit more humble. So how much of the Bible was around this time? All of it. Oh, so it's been put together? Yeah. yeah. I can't remember the date. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Of course. No. You missed the Bible being put together. No, it all been established by then. Yes. Okay. The, the actual New Testament, uh, I mean, the, the New Testament uh, with uh, Athanasius in the, um, in the West is very... Is, Sorry, the East. Um, he's got it in three six seven. Mm. In the West, it's kind of three nine seven, but it's all there, mm. which is why the reference to but, Holy Scriptures becomes right. So the Nicene Creed was before. That. It, well, it was, but the, but they, it's it all the there. whole of the Bible is all there, and the, right. there might, you know, there might be a, a few that they're still debating about. Mm. That's all, right. but they're all. They they're familiar with them all. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah, your point about sort of denomination spitting on mm. things. I sometimes wonder when I do my revision for this that some of the points they make are to do with dogma and not doctrine. Mm. Yeah. And I think we're as guilty as any other congregation. Get dogmatic things that are not important, yeah. but they become really important. And uh, seriously bothers me. Mm. And but it has been so, hasn't it? I mean, um, and at some point she'd say, look, here's a difference of opinion. And I think in history it was desperately important because otherwise we lose the very, the very crux of the faith. You know, I like the that. The things I'm referring that. to have nothing to do with faith. Just, just They're nothing to do with uh, anything to do with that. Nothing to do with the, the, the essential issues of our faith. I've got no issue. Mm. But sometimes I think there are little points that appear which are dogmatic. 
mm. and had nothing to do with her faith at all. Mm. And it, and I think, wait a sec, I disagree with what you're saying there. That's nothing to do with my faith. Mm. But, but, that, but, but that's what, I mean, I remember that argument being spun years ago with me about, well, this is the brand that is on offer. You know, whether it's mm. the Anglicans do it this way, the Baptists do it this way, then you have to make a choice about which brand. And I'm thinking, well, hold on. Is that right? No. It's very cool. Good question. It is. <laughs> well, yes. yeah. we're rebranding our church. <laughs> let's um, let's finish with a word of prayer for um, who will who will close us in prayer. Uh, I'm happy to. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> oh, heavenly Father, you are so big. Thank you that uh, we get to spend this time together to try and even make sense of uh, the enormity of you and uh, and how loving you've been and patient and, uh, yeah, um, nurturing along the way. I thank you for this time that we've had to work in, uh, I guess, resting in our case on or leaning on the, uh, uh, the journey of others in the past to uh, help us to understand today how we apply the truths that we see in your word. I thank you, Lord, that we'll continue to be grappling with these things, which are good, but ultimately, Lord, it's, uh, it's about you and your son and what the spirit does in leading us forward and uh, embedding our thoughts in your word and, uh, and being prepared to share what we come to see as true. And uh, ultimately, Lord, it's not about us, it's about you. So thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name. Oh, man, thank you. Let me get these, these dates right. We're on next Sunday, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. Why have we done 27th? And are we missing one?